Next, we have a talk from Carl Vondrick. Carl is an assistant professor at Columbia University. And just before that, he was a research scientist at Google AI. During and since his PhD at MIT, Carl has been publishing very creative and insightful computer vision work, which I know has been inspiring to me and to others. For example, Carl is the first author on Hoggles, generating videos with scene dynamics, SoundNet, and tracking emerges by colorizing videos. A consistent theme of Carl's papers is that they show it's possible to dig out useful signals and practical models from data that is only labeled loosely or sometimes not labeled at all. So it makes sense that the title he submitted for his talk today is Data and Task Generalization. Unfortunately, we do not have Carl giving his presentation live today, but he sent, to, sent us a very nicely produced video, which I'm now going to play and we can watch together. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you very much, very much for having me. I'm Carl Vonder from Columbia University, and I apologize I couldn't make it live today. I'm going to be talking about some of our recent work on generalization, both the new data distributions and new tasks. Uh, but first, I want to acknowledge my students who did most of the work I'm going to be presenting here. Uh, Chengzi Mao and Amog Gupta, uh, they led this research from start to finish. Okay, so the fuel for computer vision uh, has been the data set. And data sets like ImageNet, Coco, Connect, LabelMe, they have driven tremendous progress in the field. Uh, they provide the evidence for machine learning as well as a common framework for consistent evaluation. But the data set is also the cause of several challenges in the field. Uh, we often build algorithms that overfit to a particular data set. Um, data sets are also static and they're closed world. And what this does is, is, is data sets create predictability. And that's really the problem is, is that our world is not predictable. So I think the fundamental challenge in the field is that the visual world is op open. Um, it's fast, it's changing. And, and really, this has been the fundamental challenge in, in AI since the, the beginning. How do we get outside into the open uh, world? And so while big data has been a big advance here because it provides extensive coverage of the diversity in the visual world, uh, big data alone is not enough because the world is, is unpredictable um, and the world might change, right? Um, and so I think unpredictability is, is really the key challenge here for open world general, generalization. If you're wondering what, un what unpredictable means, all you got to do is come to New York City where you're going to see Broadway stars singing from the bedroom windows, power plants that turn the sky neon blue, and people eating dinner on New York's sub sub subways. So the ImageNet data set has, has, has driven this tremendous progress in the field uh, for you know, a large number of cat, 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 cat categories. But the moment the model is, encounters examples that are outside of the training distribution, which is going to happen in the open world, the performance is going to, is going to drop. Um, and so the work I'm presenting here today is, is, is inspired by, by some results um, from a recent data set, Ob Ob ObjectNet which collects Im images for the same categories as, as ImageNet, but it's gonna change the spurious correlations. So they have things like bananas, right, between the two data set, they have things like bicycles, right? The here, here the correlations have changed, right? Um, and same thing, thing for wheels, um, right? And so here the, the color has just changed between the data sets, the, the view, view, view points, but really in both, in both sets of images, it's, it's all the same thing, it's, it's, it's a, a wheel. So, what this paper showed was that after learning on ImageNet and then directly testing on ObjectNet, there was a significant drop in performance, um, as shown by, by this plot from the, the pap pap paper. And this is a great illustration for the perils of dataset bias. Uh, but the point I want to make here is actually larger than just dataset bias. And the point is that the research community was able to surprise computer vision models with examples from an op open world. As time goes on, the, the field will, will overfit the object as well, right? Um, but then there'll be another data set that will, will surprise us. And I think this, this cycle reveals the, the key, key problem. Because we live in an open world, we're always, able to keep, we're always able to keep surprising our computer vision models. And this is leading to many of the failures that we, we see today. And so if we really want to take our computer systems outside of the lab and, and out, outside of, of the, our, our, our data sets, um, they, they, they need to be robust to this type of surprise and, and, and this type of, of generalization. Okay, so what is the underlying is issue here? Why does this ha happen? 
The underlying problem is that discriminative models are going to learn to use the spurious correlations in the data set in order to classify Im images. So for, for example, there might be a bench inside of a park, um, and, 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 and this will often have grass in the background, right? An image of a bench in a park will often have grass in the background. Uh, but there's no causal relationship between, between a bench and, 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 and grass. And the problem is that descriptive models are basically going to improperly exploit this spurious con on, 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 on text um, to do the classification task. But when, when, this, when, this con when the spurious context no longer holds, uh, the model will consequently fail. And this is what's going on with ob object net. So to formalize this a little bit more, uh, we can sketch basically the image creation process as a causal model. Uh, and, and in this model, the, the true unobserved category, this is noted on the far left, is going to cause both background and foreground features in the, the image. Um, and, and these features are, are, are going to in turn produce the observed image that we see, as well as the label that we assign the, the image. So for example, the foreground features are going to be the features that we're, we're in, 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 interested in. Um, these are things like the shape, the texture, and the color. Background features are going to be the nuisance features that we don't want not to care about. Uh, these are things like the viewpoint, the context, or the illumina illumination. But the problem here is that because we only observe the image and the corresponding label, there's a serious correlation between the foreground and, 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 and background. Um, since the discriminative models are going to e exploit both, uh, they will not robustly generalize. So in the ideal world, what we'd want them to do is change this dis distribution. Um, and, and the way we change this distribution is we want to in intervene on the causal process and randomize the background fe features um, without changing the, the category or the foreground features. And so by in intervening on the background, we remove the causal link between the category and the background features, um, creating a train distribution that is independent of the spurious correlations. However, in practice, it's actually quite difficult to perform this intervention. Um, one promising approach has been active approaches, where you directly intervene on the data generating process. Um, and this area has really been rapidly growing in popularity lately. Um, there's quite a lot of simulators that have come out, and they're very, very realistic. They're actually quite, 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 quite cool. Um, and and what, these, what these simulators let, let you do is, is, is let you actively change right, your, your, your di distribution. Um, but the problem is that we're still limited by what we're able to s simulate. Um, and we're also limited by the types of robots that we can, we can physically build. It's actually quite hard to go build a robot. So the approach that we've taken is we think there's a, there's a very exciting opportunity here with generative models. Um, image synthesis is starting to basically automate Photoshop well enough that we can convincingly manipulate images at, at, at scale. So while this has been used for deep, deep fakes, um, we think it also can be used, used, used for good. Um, and we can manipulate I I images to construct interventions. Before we proceed, I think the obvious question is, why would this work? If generative models are estimated on the same change distribution as the discriminative model, where is the additional juice coming from? Generative models will never be able to generate fully novel images, and so there's obviously lim limitations here. However, there are two main advantages. The first is that generative models can generate novel comp compositions, um, and they can do this by, by, by applying known transformations to new images. The second is that they can make minimal changes to, to uh, the, the images, keeping the foreground features fixed while only changing the, the background. Um, so for example, uh, here, here is the same transformation applied in the lat latent space of a generative model. This is the, the, the big, gam, big gam model from DeepMind. Um, this transformation corresponds to an out-of-plane rotation. And I think that what, what was interesting about, about this is that even though it's the same transformation in latent space, it's the same translation vector um, uh, in, in latent space, it, it, it visually corresponds to the same transformation in, in image space. Um, and so across you know, a variety of different categories. <clears throat> so what, what, this, what this shows, and this has also been shown by, by, by several different works in, in the last few years, 
is that the latest generation models are equivariant to a large number of categories for a large number of transformations. Um, and, and here we're just showing a, a, a few, right? Um, what these transformations let you do is you can move the camera, you can change the lighting, you can change the back background. This is, and this is basically our toolbox of what interventions we can apply uh, to the, the training dis di distribution. Okay, so our, our, our final approach is, is, is going to be this. It's actually quite simple. Um, <clears throat> is that we're going to leverage this equivariance property of generative models in order to construct in, 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 in interventions and only change the background features while holding everything else fixed. And so the way we're going to do this is we're going to first embed our images into our latent space. And this is going to put them on a, a hypersphere. Um, and then we're going to perform an, an, an intervention on, uh, inside this, this latent space by translating the embedding along the hypersphere. So there's a couple different ways to choose this direction. Um, and we're going to use a variant of PCA that finds the directions with the maximal change. Uh, this is the same technique that is used by GAN, GAN space. And we can then decode this new, this new point um, uh, to an image in, in order to produce a manipulated image. Um, and, 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 and what we're going to do is both of these images, both the original image and the and intervention, are going to be added to our training set. So what, 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 what does this do to, to the train distribution, right? When we perform this in, 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 in intervention in generative models, what, what, what change does that do, 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 do to the causal graph, graph here? <clears throat> what it does is it's going to factor out the viewpoint features from the back background, um, which is effectively removing the, the and, and then effectively removing the incoming edge from the category to the view, 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 viewpoint fe features. This is going to make the viewpoint independent of the category, um, removing that spurious correlation. <clears throat> okay, and so the high-level intuition here is that since every object appears on, under nearly every view, the viewpoint now no longer has discriminatory power. Um, so the model is not going to learn to use the viewpoint for classification. And so, of course, to mitigate more spurious correlations, we have to just repeat the same process, finding, finding different in, 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 in intervention directions and the latent space. In practice, we can find a variety of, 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 of different in, in, in interventions corresponding to several different types of transformations. Okay, so we need to mention, you know, you know this process is not perfect. Um, we cannot mitigate all, all possible spurious correlations uh, with, 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 with this approach. Um, some categories are just going to be harder to generate. Some transformations are not, not possible yet. Um, however, what we hypothesize is that as generative models become stronger, we should expect robustness to improve as well. So we experimented with this approach on a couple of different data sets, and I'm just going to show you the most ch challenging. Um, specifically, we use our approach to modify the Im ImageNet di distribution and then directly test it on the ObjectNet data set. Um, so there's no fine tuning on the target data set at, 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 at here, right? You get no, you, you're not doing any training, no, no parameter estimation, no hyperparameter fitting on 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 on, on the test 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 set. Um, so we we just used a, a standard in our experience. We just used a standard ResNet 152 model with the default hyperparameters. Okay, so here are the results. <clears throat> so as reported by the original authors of of, of ObjectNet. Training on, on an ImageNet and then testing on ObjectNet produces a 48% uh, percent, uh, top 5 ac accuracy. If you just naively sample from, from um, 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 the GAN to enlarge the, the, the training set uh, without doing any, any in intervention, this is going to improve the, the numbers to 55%. And this makes sense, right? You have more and more training data now. However, if you, if you use exactly the same number of, of sam 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 samples, but instead perform an, 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 an intervention. So rather, rather than just drawing samples from the model, we're going we're gonna to use the model to intervene on, on, on our tra training set. Um, this, this actually further improves, improves, improves the results by nearly 57 uh, uh, per percent. Um, <clears throat> and so these results are actually complementary with traditional aug augmentation, such as color jittering or, or, or contrast jittering. Um, and so what this shows is that the augmentations are offering additional improve, improvement over an, 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 an intervention 
I'm still maintaining a consistent relative ranking. I think this table underscore is a key point here. It's not just the size of the data set or the number of augmentations. Uh, constructing interventions that make the background features lose their, lose their discriminatory powers is cr critical. And interventions that block shortcuts provide a bigger bang for, for your buck. So one of the advantages of learning a causal representation is that the model gets the prediction right for the right reasons. Um, after we, we learn, we analyze which spatial regions contributed to the classification the most using grad, grad cam. The middle column shows the base baseline. The model latches on a spurious context, such as the chord or, 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 or the, the rec rectangle, and consequently makes the wrong prediction. However, in, in our, our model, which is shown in the right column here, uh, it, it instead latches onto the correct spatial region and makes the right classification. Uh, here's several more examples. Uh, models trained on on, on, on ImageNet but te tested on, on ObjectNet, they, they frequently just latch on the spurious correlations that no longer hold when the data distribution changes. And, and this is the cause of, the, of their poor performance. So this area of robustness is, 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 is growing rapidly. Uh, there's several and there's several papers that came out in the last year that really inspired us, um, and and so while data augmentation is often seen as a practical hack, um, there are, there is still an underlying statistical ex ex explanation for why it improves performance and, and robustness so so much. Um, in particular, um, what we what we think is that different gen models are going to allow us to perform complex interventions to natural in, in, images. And I expect that as genetic models improve, the robustness is all, all, also going to improve. So we've so far discussed how genetic models can provide robustness for discriminative models when the data distribution will change. But in the open world, not just the data will change, the, the task might change as well. Uh, so this next part of the presentation, I'm gonna talk about how genetic models can be helpful for transfer when the task distribution will change. In particular, self-supervised learning provides a key result for the transferability of genetic models across tasks. Uh, for example, in, in image colorization, we would train a conditional model to generate the colors of a black and white photo. Uh, and these models work very well, both at color generation as well as transfer to new, new tasks. Uh, several works have established image colorization as a strong self-supervised task for learning representations uh, just in the last uh, you know, few, few years. So learning generative models for colorization is powerful because the model needs to learn the underlying data generation process. For example, if I take my mug and I ask the model to recover the color, the underlying data generating process is as object motion. In order to correctly colorize this frame, the model needs to learn to track objects. Since nearly every video has color naturally contained in it, we think video colorization can be a strong self-supervised signal for learning object tracking. What we propose to do in a, in a paper that we published at the last ECCV is that we formulate the, the tracking problem as reconstructing the color in a grayscale fit video given one colorful reference frame. In order for the model to solve this task, what the model needs to do is propagate color throughout the, the, the video video, which it does by internally learning to track. So th th this, this is possible because there is a general temporal coherence in color uh, just in natural video. It would be you know, very surprising if, for example, uh, the boy's shirt here uh, in the second column were to suddenly change from blue to, to red. And so it's, it's due to this coherence that, 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 that generative models um, will basically learn to track ob ob objects internally, even though we train this without any human su supervision. There are you know, a variety of, of, of obvious ex 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 exceptions here. Um, for example, if I turn on a green light, all the colors are gonna change. Um, there's there's well-known issues with color over constancy, uh, as, as well as several you know, color illusions. Um, but, but for the most part, unconstrained video is gonna have naturally temporally coherent color. And we think this is gonna be a great signal for learning to track. So the standard approach um, in, 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 in colorization for images basically asks the question, what color is this pixel, right? For every single pixel in the image, you, you wanna predict what, 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 is, what is the corresponding color that goes along with it. 
Instead, we're going to ask, ask, ask the question, not what color is this, but where should you copy the color from? Um, and, and the idea is that if you want to predict the color of, 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 of this person's shirt in the last, last, last frame, um, we'd have to figure out where should we grab it from in the other frame, right? Where, if we had to go copy and paste the, the, the color of this person's shirt, where should we, we, we put our color picker to grab, uh, grab the, the, the color from? And so in order to solve this, this, this task, um, uh, you know, this is, the model basically has to, has to learn to a, a, estimate correspondences a, a, a across time. And in other words, track objects inter, inter, in, 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 internally. I mean, all, all, all that's going on here is you have, you have basically a generative model of color in video that is going to learn the underlying process for track, 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 tracking. Um, a, a key point here is that we can actually develop this model that's so that's robust to out, 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 outliers. You know, the, the, the correct place we want to grab this color from is is is, is the person's shirt, not not on not on this towel that happens to be laying on the bed. It just happens to be the same you know, c c c c color here. And so the reason why I think this this, this hap happens is that the model is going to be more robust. It, it, it's going to it's going to minimize the training error better. Um, if 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 it if it's able if it actually learns the right course or responses across time, um, so if it were to cop, copy the color from the towel uh, hanging on the bed at, at, at here, that that might and, and kind of if on a large collection of videos that might not be the the optimal thing to do in order to minimize the, the training error because the color might might not have happened to match. Um, so instead, what the model should learn to do is actually latch, latch on to the true process here. Um, which is uh, the, the the motion. Um, so to, to make this idea a little bit more con 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 concrete, um, we're going to formulate the problem as 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 as, 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 as this. Um, given a input frame uh, that's going to be in gray grayscale, um, what we want to do is is try to look up for every for every pixel in the input frame. We want to look up um, what the corresponding color should be. In a, a re reference frame that ha has has color, um, so in other words, we're going to try to we're gonna train the model to take in the the, the pixels in, in the input frame and try to point where is the the corresponding color uh, coming from in the in the grayscale reference. Once once the model points, we're going to then look up the corresponding color and copy and paste 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 that 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 back. So we're going to write this correspondence. Respondents here um, be, be, between these these two grayscale image patches as a, a matrix A, um, where uh, AIJ is going to score the similarity between patch I in the reference frame and patch J in the input frame, and uh, the similarity uh, is, is is just going to be as estimated from the uh, from from a learned uh, features coming from a common convolutional net, which we're going to write as as as, as F. Um, here, F, 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 I, and F, and F, F, and F, J. And so there's a variety of different similarity metrics that we, we can use. Um, we chose a very simple one, um, which is just the, uh, which is just the inner in, in, in product to, to distance normalized by softmax. Um, so that's written as the equation here on the top, 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 top right. Um, and the important property of, 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 of the similarity uh, metric is that it's going to sum to one, right? Um, so because because it's, it's normalized with a softmax, AIJ is going to sum sum um, for one, sum to one um, as you average o, 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 over the entire reference frame. So then the final color um, that the model is is is, is going to be, is going to predict, we can write as just a linear combination of all the colors in the reference frame weighted <coughs> by the similarity matrix A. a, a. Um, and so our predicted color C hat here, so our predicted color for for for, for pixel J, um, is just is ju is just this weighted sum of all 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 the other colors in the reference frame C C I, um, weighted by a, 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 a I J. So what's nice about this 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 formulation is that it's actually very easy to train this model now. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we all have to do. We all have to do is we have to take our prediction um, uh, for 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 the color and compare it to the ground truth color um, that that we know, um, and then we just can write down a loss fun function be between these and try to 
and, and, and train the model uh, to, to minimize the distance between the true color uh, and, the, and the predicted one. Um, because every, every operation here is, is differentiable, it's very easy to calculate the, the great gradients. Um, and so in particular, what we can do is, is we, can, we can train this, 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 this model, basically training the parameters of a convolutional net F, F here um, to learn an embedding space such that when it goes through this operation of copy and paste, it's going to be, be, be able to propagate the colors from one frame to, 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 to the next. So I, I think there's, there's some in, in, in interesting historical context here um, uh, <clears throat> where you know, how, how color film was originally done um, you know, before the digital cam camera. Um, and so uh, you know, t t t in, 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 in kind of the first color film, where the very first color film was, was made in, 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 uh, made in, in the year 1902, was basically the same way we annotate data today. There was a studio or a crowd of, of people um, that would sit through uh, the video and manually paint right um, each each frame um, with uh, with the, the color. They take a paint brush and actually try to paint 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 on 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 the black 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 and white film. And what was very important here was that if you wanted the, the film to look realistic, uh, you had to be very careful. <clears throat> right, the, the the people who did, who did the painting had to be very careful. At how they they paint the uh, the the film. Um, so here is uh, an example of the very first uh, color film. Um, this was produced in uh, 1895. It's it's pretty cool, right? Because the 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 uh, the, co the colors that people paint into each, each frame were 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 not not right, right? And so this 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 led to this very artistic of, of, of effect. But I think this, what, what this example illustrates is actually an important point, which is that when you mess up the, the color, when the color is not temporarily co 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 coherent, it's, 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 it's very obvious, right? And so this is why we think this is a good signal to learn to track. Okay, so um, here are some results from our model. This is about 100 years later, right? Um, and so this is our, our model trained, trained to do the colorization task. Um, the reference frame that we provided the model is on the left here. This is the first frame of the video. And the, uh, the middle column shows the grayscale video as the input. Um, the right frame is the predicted color from the mod model. Um, so this is, the, this is the colors that the model is trying to generate conditioned on the reference frame and the gray, grayscale vi vi video. I think I think what's pretty interesting about this is is just how well uh, it, it it works in pra practice. Um, so uh, you know this model we we trained on a large collection of unlabeled videos. Uh, I think it was trained on the, the kinetics data set, um, and uh, you know it works in a variety of different, different situations. So people dancing, you know, even eggs that are being scrambled on on the on, on the pot. Um, you'll notice one one f failure here. Um, which is the person's uh, legs and hands. Um, the model off, off, often gets wrong, and that's because they're actually not they're actually included in the reference frame, right? So there's no there's no valid correspondence there, and so the, the model makes a mistake mistake there. Um, one of my favorite examples is the eggs eggs here. Uh, this is a really difficult situation for tracking, right? Um, uh, this object is going you know, a, 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 the eggs here are going under significant um, deformation, um, and so I think something like optic flow just would not work here. Um, here's here, here's a couple more examples. Um, so a person swimming in, swimming in water, butter spreading on toast. Again, you know these are very challenging situations for traditional trackers, right? Um, but this model, which is a trained in a large large amount of video, is actually able to learn a process for color prop propagation um, in these pretty complex uh, situations. So the key result here is that even though this is trained on the colorization uh, uh, problem, right? Given a video, can you generate what, 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 what the color should, should be? Uh, what our experiments show is that tracking actually emerges automatically, even though it's not trained without any human supervision. Um, and the key idea here is that this pointing mechanism, this arrow uh, between the input frame and the reference frame, um, th this is acting as a tracker, right? 
um, the, the, the model has to internally learn how, how to, how to, how to, how to uh, move this point, point in, 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 into around in order to propagate the colors, which we can then reuse as, 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 a, as an approach for, for, for track, tracking. Um, and so the, 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 the very simple way that we can show, show this is we basically take the exactly the same model, which was trained on the colorization task, but then at test time, ra rather than uh, uh, ha having it propagate colors, we're going to propagate a segmentation mask um, uh, <clears throat> to the, 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 the target frames. Um, and <clears throat> the reason why this, this works um, is because the way the SLOS is uh, formulated here, uh, it, it's actually non-parametric in the la labels, right? So it's, it's, it's not fixed to a certain label space. All this is doing is trying to learn a correspondence. And once you've learned the correspondence, we can propagate anything that we, we, we want. Um, so the, the underlying machinery remains the same. Okay, so here are a couple of, of, of examples on the Davis data set. Um, so <clears throat> this is a model that was trained for um, uh, tra trained for colorization, but then we test it without any additional training on the tracking task. Um, and the only supervision here is, is the first frame of e e each video, right? So we have to specify the object of, of interest. It's not a self-starting tracker, but if you specify the ob object of, 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 of interest as a segmentation mask, uh, this, this underlying model is able to propagate it forward. Um, and so the colors here work on, um, are, are, are indicating different instances. Um, and you can see it, it works in pretty complex situ situations. Considering it's never trained on tracking, right? It works in pretty complex situations. Um, you know, the one of my favorite examples is is, is, is the, uh, the the ball that becomes partially occluded, right? This model is still able to handle things like occlusions. Um, it, it also works on objects that have the same color. Um, and, and I think this is an important point, right? So in, 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 the, in, the, in the video on the, on the top left and in the middle column at, at, at the top, um, the people are, are, are wearing this, the same color clothes, whether it's white lab, lab coats or, or, or white, or white um, you know, sports uniforms. Um, <clears throat> and even though the people have the same, are wearing, wearing the same color clothes, uh, the, model is not a, the model does not get confused between them. Um, and I think this, this, this happens because the model is actually learning the, pro the underlying process here, right? It's, it's learning about object motion. It's not learning just, just the, the simple correlations in the data. Okay, um, here's, here's a few more examples, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, just in terms of, of, uh, of you know, pe people uh, having uh, kind of unusual formations, dogs turning around, um, uh, you know, the, the example on the top top left left here shows uh, an example of, of an extreme occlusion. There's a total occlusion and the model does not recover, right? So this is still still a key problem here is how do you create a representation of space, right? This is, this is, I think this is something that's still missing in the model is how do you have a robust representation of space? But because the model is trained on, on, on unlabeled video, um, uh, you know, we can transfer to a variety of different tracking tasks. Um, so we also experimented with trying to do uh, uh, tracking of human pose. Um, and so here's, here's a couple of examples of this, where we try to propagate this, this skeleton, it's annotated in the first frame forward. Um, and so this model, you know, it, 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 it works, it works pr 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 pretty well here um, in terms of propagating pose. And so, uh, in particular, what this example shows is that this is learning, um, you know, a point-to-point -point correspondence here, right? Uh, in order to get the skeleton right uh, in the future frames, right, it has to act to actually track the elbow, right? It actually has to track the hand, right? It's, it's, it's not just just tracking the the the, the general region. Um, and so I, I think this, this is quite cool. It's suggesting that this model is actually learning a, a very good, 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 good policy for tr tr tracking. Okay, so we can analyze this model um, in terms of its performance. And the way we chose to analyze this was the uh, using a standard a pro, standard metric on the Davis data set, which is the average performance in terms of segment overlap. Um, and we're gonna analyze this versus time. 
<clears throat> so the, the the simple baseline here is because because we get we get the annotations for the first first frame is the very simple baseline is just the identity baseline, which is you just uh, you, you assume the video is static, and of course that drops off quite 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 fast. Um, we also experimented with a, a baseline based off of optic flow. Um, this was using FlowNet two. Um, and so this this actually you know this of course beats this this the uh, the the uh, naive baseline of, of the ident identity here, um, but it's still hard, right? It's still Davis is a pretty hard 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 data set. Okay, um, and so here here's what the model on colorization does, um, right? Uh, it, it because it's trained on so many videos with so much di diversity. Uh, it's actually fairly robust to a lot of the complexities that you'll have in tra tracking, whether it's scale change or uh, occlusion or deformation, right? Um, and so th this is, is is able to out outperform these these baselines. Now, of course, the the highly supervised approaches, um, you know, the ones that use ImageNet and and, and use all all types of annotations. Uh, those are much much higher than this, right? Th 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 those are still the, the state of the art. Um, uh, but the key point here is, is can you learn to track without any human supervision? Um, and, and what this is suggesting is that colorization, actually, in particular generating color um, of the future frames, uh, is actually a, a, a good, good self-supervised signal for learning to track. So our, our, our final experiment was to analyze the embeddings and try to interpret what type of um, features does this model learn. Uh, the way we experimented with this was we uh, <clears throat> we projected uh, the learned features down to three dimensions with P PCA, um, and then we vi visualized them as an, an, R an RGB movie. So you know, a red corresponds to the first PCA component, the green channel corresponds to the second PCA component, and, and so on. And what we found, which is pretty pretty in in interesting, is that Inside the, the latent space that the, the, the model learns, it actually learns to separate out different objects. Um, and so this is, you know, this is showing, for example, that, that the dog, that, that, that the skydiver, that, that, that the skier, right, um, they all lie in a different part of the lat latent space. And the model is basically lear learning uh, to, 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 to do the separation all, by, all on its own um, without, a, a, without a human su supervision. Okay, I'll wrap up here. Um, I, I think generative models are quite exciting as we push computer vision into the o open world uh, because they provide robustness to data distribution changes as well as an efficiency for task transfer. And in particular, I think one of the most exciting directions forward is better understanding why these mechanisms work or can practice. If we can better understand the emergent capabilities of generative models, I expect we can build more robust and efficient computer vision systems. Um, thank you very much.